Okay, we're going to have a little trouble here, but uh, just bear with us. Uh, I'm using my little uh, notebook computer here to run this presentation. It's got some heavy video, but hey, what the hell. Oh, one second. All right, here we go. So, uh, name of my talk today, get, out, get Your Game Out of My Movie, Narrative Design in Mass Effect 2. So, I want to talk about the title, because actually a lot of people have been asking me about this, and what it kind of means. And really, uh, for a Bioware game, we really don't differentiate between game and story. Uh, they're pretty much the same thing. They, um, there are, we start with story, and we add gameplay, but really they're... Um, they're symbiont to each other. They don't, we don't really differentiate between the two. And really, I think the title itself kind of just encapsulates what we believe the, the rest of the industry is really struggling with right now, which is the fact that, you know, we have story, we have gameplay, but we're really trying to merge them. So what this presentation is going to be about is how we solve those issues uh, for Mass Effect 2. So who's this guy talking to you? Well... My name is Armando Troisi. I'm the lead cinematic designer on the Mass Effect franchise. Uh, I've been with the team uh, for about four and a half years now, and I've been running uh, what we call the cinematic design department. And cinematic design is really kind of an odd thing. It doesn't really exist in a lot of places. And um, we just uh, kind of... Sorry, Frank. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that would be a good one for later on. Um, so what is cinematic design? Well, we're narrative designers um, uh, first, and we're cinematic artists second. And what we really deal with is the how of interactive storytelling and the how of interactive narrative. We provide the writers with the tools and the processes to create the interactive conversations that are in the game. And when we talk about the interactive conversations, we're really talking about the main way that we're communicating with the player. It is the main device in which we... Um, we um, um, get story to the player and have them understand uh, what the intent of the writer and the rest of the narrative design team is doing. So, really, what are we talking about here today? Well, we're going to talk about a couple of things. First thing is story perspective. And if there's any writers out there, they understand that story perspective is a very powerful thing. And it even gets even more complicated once you add the player to the mix of uh, protagonist and antagonist, and we're going to be addressing some of those issues uh, that we encountered in the many uh, role-playing games that we've made at Bioware. The second is the agreement, and the agreement is really the rules in which we deal with interactivity in the cinematic space and how we apply those rules to uh, what we're trying to achieve with the role-playing experience. And, you know, we all know them, don't know if we all love them, but quick time events. Uh, we've added quick time events to conversations in Mass Effect. And I'm gonna, we're going to go through kind of what the process was in designing those and making sure that they, um, um, they're part of this agreement. Um, you know, they fit into our narrative design structure. And we're going to have some Q&A at the end of this. Uh, so you can ask me all types of great questions. So firstly, um, a Bioware game is composed of what we, what we call the pillars of design. And really, they're story, exploration, progression, and gameplay. So we have this concept of activity chaining, which happens between these four different quadrants of the player experience. And the one we're going to be concentrating on today is story. But that's not to mean that the other parts don't have story. Like, they obviously do. But in, in terms of referencing and framing this, this uh, discussion today, we're going to be talking about um, this interactive cinematic space. And this is our product. Um, this is the, you know, the conversation system that uh, hopefully a lot of you got to play. And uh, we're going to be talking about the mechanics behind story and how we uh, navigated the minefield of different uh, player choice and agency. 
So firstly, let's try to define what we call a conversation. And the first thing that I think of really is that it's a narrative tool. It's a way for us to communicate with the player. And there's lots of narrative tools that we use. We use ambient dialogue. We use video, video screens. We use uh, codexes. We use a, a myriad of, of techniques to communicate. But this is our primary narrative tool. And, and secondly, it's a game system. Uh, it, allow, it is a massive, massive thing that we develop at BioWare. And it allows us to coordinate the content from dif disciplines like art and writing and animation and level design and bring it all together and to make these great interactions. And it's also a philosophy. When we talk about conversation at Bioware, we're talking about this character interaction, this emotional storytelling that we're really trying to achieve. So this is something we're always working on, always trying to evolve. And this is the scary part of a Bioware game. Um, this is the conversation tree, and I, I know a lot of people have a lot of opinions about conversation trees and, and you know, whether or not they're uh, uh, a good way to do interactive narrative and interactive dialogue, but it really works for us. We really have spent many, many years refining this uh, particular uh, way of communicating with the player. And, you know, and it's the one thing that's very common to all Bioware games. We all use this basic technology, everything from Baldur's Gate to the new MMO uses this technology and this design principle. But if you look very closely and very deeply into this, this crazy web, you'll notice that there's one thing that is inherent to what we're trying to achieve. And it's the idea of choice. And choice in cinematics is something we, we take really seriously at Bioware. And it's the culmination of all the animations, the cameras, uh, the scripting, the dialogue, the VO, and we bring it all together. And what we're trying to do is just really make sure that the player understands, hey, you know what, this is your story. This, this story doesn't belong to the writers. This story belongs to the players. And we really try to uh, imbue everything we do with that kind of sensibility. So in order to frame this discussion, we're going to be talking about perspective. And uh, when we talk about perspective, we're talking about a couple of different things. Uh, we're talking about the point of view in which the player interacts with the story. And in Bioware games, it really comes down to two different types of, of categories. One is subjective and one is objective. So subjective. Uh, we have a huge history of doing these types of games, and I'm sure you can recognize uh, a, a lot of them up there. Um, it really, and really, um, what a subjective game is is a traditional role-playing, computer role-playing experience. It's, it's the one that we've all known for many, many years where you are the avatar and, or the playing character. Um, dialogue responses that you make are verbatim. Um, there's no interpretation. What you say is what your player says. There's uninterrupted agency, which means that my character doesn't act without me actually telling him what to do. He, he doesn't act on his own. It, I'm, there's always a, a level of choice that happens moment to moment between me and my avatar. And it's really great. Um, it allows us to quickly empathize with the avatar and, and, and it, in order to get into his head. And this is really the design of, you know, this, this is you. Um, um, this is not someone else. This is you playing the game. But there's a couple of things that happens and, and that we're going to be looking at right now. And the first is really some of the side effects that happens from this subjective point of view. And it's temporal distortion and really lots of dialogue. So temporal distortion happens when choices are being made or your player says something. And we usually say, oh, your player's silent. But no, your player's not silent. We just sped up time really fast. And we just chopped out that time and we went straight to whatever the response was. And really what happens is, uh, in that type of situation, uh, the, the NPC has to hold up a lot of the dialogue on their own. So there's a lot more exposition that needs to happen. So we're going to take a look at a clip here from Knights of the Old Republic in which we, uh, we use this subjective storytelling technique. Back again? Is there something old Garouk can do for you? Or did you just come to chat with a lonely old man? So once again, this is the distortion that happens when you're making a choice. My mind isn't as sharp as it used to be. That's why I'm giving up the gambler's life. But I think I can still manage to answer some simple questions. And again, some more distortion. 
when you make a choice. We're saying time has stopped at this point, and you are now contemplating your next, um, your next choice. So, uh, and I forgive me for the choppy video. Um, I'm running this thing off my little laptop here, so um, uh, just forgive me for that, please. Um, so here we go. Now we get into the objective story. And this is kind of what some of our newer titles are doing, uh, especially for the Mass Effect franchise. And it, it actually brings, uh, brings along a lot of new challenges. So when we talk about objective story, it's really counter to the traditional role-playing model. You are not the avatar. So when people say that, they get kind of weirded out because they're like, Shepard's me. But you're not, no, you, it's really not. And I'm going to explain why you, well, most people feel that way about Shepard. Uh, but you are not Shepard. Shepard has his own motivations. He has his own voice. He's, a, he's, a, he's an actual character. He's more akin to Kratos than, uh, than anything like on Dragon Age or, or any of the other titles. So Avatar has his own voice and motivations. The player is now voyeuristic to the whole experience. And this is when we get into what we call the interactive movie model, where you're very, um, you're very objective to what's happening and you're kind of watching things and then trying to control it through your choice. So a lot of, there's a lot of reasons why we try to do this. Uh, really, it's this idea of real-time narrative environment uh, that actually removes a lot of these temporal distortions that we saw with the previous clip. Um, and the temporal distortions being when you make a choice or you're waiting for a choice. So this allowed us to really break through and add drama to these interactions, which is something which our project director really wanted to do. And this is really the breakthrough in interactive storytelling that we made with uh, Mass Effect. So we're going to take a look at Mass Effect, and uh, we're going to we're going to see this real time uh, environment in action. What are you looking at? The man who damn it. I'm not looking for trouble. Maybe I am. Maybe you better get out of here before I find you some. All right, all right. I, I've got stuff to do anyway. Come on, let's get out of here. So as you can see, it was a very fluid interaction. You've made a choice. Nothing really stopped. Um, and a lot of cool stuff just kind of happened around you, and uh, it really feels like it's real time, and, and it really feels good. It feels very cinematic at that point. But I'm wondering if a lot of people out there who are very traditional notice something very odd about what Shepard did. And um, so if, uh, if you can take it just a little quick guess at what I'm trying to allude to. Let's roll the clip again, and let's take another look. Man who's damn about to ruin. Uh, I, I'm not looking for trouble. Maybe I am. Maybe you better get out of here before I find you some. All right, all right. I, I've got stuff to do anyway. Come on, let's get out of here. So, um, I wonder, did anybody catch it at all? Oh, nice, exactly. So, what it was is auto reply. So Shepard acted on his own without me telling him to do something. I didn't want to say that. As a player, I'm like, okay, well, what if I wanted to turtle? What if I wanted to make another choice? Um, you know, Shepard just did something. Maybe I didn't want to. Like, you know, am I disconnecting from this role-playing experience? My, my agency has just been interrupted. Like, so, you know, what's going on here? Was it lack of choice? Was it an anti-role-playing design? And really, with so many of these traditional rules broken, why is Mass Effect such a successful RPG experience? And really, it comes down to what we call the agreement. And the agreement is something that we have with the player. It's a set of rules that binds us to the player and the player to the designer to make sure that their role-playing experience is always um, expected and uh, is always in line with their expectations. So what is the agreement? Well, it's a covenant the designer makes with the player. It's a set of rules that governs choice and expectation, and we'll be getting into these in some detail. It binds the player to the role-playing experience and allows the player to access the avatar. So it, al it allows us to have this very fluid, very first-person, very uh, subjective role-playing experience while still, ha while still maintaining this, this objective um, point of view in the story. So what is the agreement we made? Well, every time we're writing things at BioWare or at, um, on Mass Effect, we always come down to some certain principles. 
uh, which is a litmus test for us to say whether or not this is a good role-playing experience or not. And really, these are them. And um, we often describe them as the covenant. This is something to us is very sacred and something that we, uh, we always come back to and something that's just so important for us to maintain that role-playing experience. So first, interface for choice is always predictable. Choice produces results the player expects. Give the player the choices they want and hopefully when they want to make them. And, as, and the last one is the player story. The play, the, the, like I said before, the, the, the story doesn't belong to the writers. The writers give you this great multipath narrative. They give you this probability space to play in. But you make your own story. So let's look at some of these things. So interfor- interface for choice is predictable. And what are we really talking about? Well, it's the conversation wheel. Um, the conversation wheel is a GUI interface that we introduced uh, that replaced the list system that uh, we see with a lot of the subjective narrative games that we produced. And really, it was a re- in response also to the high def era and the fact that we didn't have, uh, you know, the black bars, um, the letterboxing to put words in. So we needed something that was very slick and very intuitive. And also, now that we moved to this a uh, different model when we were now that we're um, objective to the experience. We didn't have to write out the whole response anymore. So we came up with a slick little interface, which actually ended up becoming uh, a very core component to our narrative design. So if we look behind this interface, it's the dialogue tree, which we saw. And really, when we look at the blue, the, the blue responses, these are all Shepard's responses or his potential responses uh, for that interaction. So we're taking this and we're mapping it to a nice simple GUI that a player can easily uh, interface with. So we know what the conversation wheel is. It's a a dialogue navigation interface which allows the player to interface with the story. And we get get all these choices and we map them to these uh, various points of the radial. And we have an indicator that we move around and we can make choices. And it's, uh, and, and it's pretty easy breezy. It's a, it's a very simple kind of interface. Uh, but we're gonna look, we're gonna look deep into it, uh, cause even though it appears to be very simple, there's a lot of mechanics that run behind it, uh, which allow us to, to keep that predictability that I was speaking of. So, firstly, uh, we talk about the behavioral player. And when we talk about behavioral, we're talking about the different parts of the wheel actually mean something different every, uh, to, to, to a writer or to an interaction. For example, uh, if you look where it says paragon, every time you pick uh, the upper right, it's a paragon response. Regardless of what it says or what it does, it's, uh, it has a subtext or it has an emotion that's attached to it. Uh, in this case, paragon means do the right thing in the right way. Um, whereas neutral is, you know, it's very kind of bland, usually ends the dialogue. Renegade is do whatever you want, like do what you have to do to get the job done. Friendly and hostile, pretty self-explanatory. And investigate is always give me more information. So we have this kind of uh, interface now where someone can just be flicking the stick around without getting into a lot of detail and really get whatever they want out of that interaction. If they're playing as a paragon or if they're kind of mad at the guy, they can switch it to renegade. And they don't really have to read too far into uh, exactly what's going to happen. They don't have to read too far into that role-playing experience. So obviously this is the first layer of predictability. Um, um, So it allows us to um, uh, shape the narrative according to um, the behavioral player. Mapped emotional reaction. So, and reaction is exactly it. Uh, most of the time, people who play this way don't really wait for the scene to end. They, they're just, as soon as the wheel pops up, they're just making choices, and they're getting rewarded with a very fluid cinematic experience at that point. And one of the things that it does, it also, uh, the direction on the wheel also colors uh, what is going to happen. And we'll get into that uh, on the next slide, but really, um, it adds a lot of subtext to what's going on, and I'll explain that in the next slide. So the cognitive player. Um, the cognitive player is the, the, 
the role player. It's the person who wants to really read into what's going on, wants to make a careful choice, and, and be very exacting on what's going on. So we add these things called paraphrases. And paraphrases are really small, um, I think it's 32 characters that were allowed in, in a paraphrase. But they're a condensed version of what is going to be said next. And it's really, sometimes it can even be described as what's in the player's head right before he says it as well. So when we look at this, we have uh, several kind of choices here. So we're going to be looking at the first one here, uh, second layer of predictability, sure. Uh, we're going to be looking at um, this first choice here. So when we look at this choice, which is I'll look into this, uh, we understand it to be in the Paragon section of the wheel. So when, as you can imagine, that line can be said or interpreted in so many different ways. But because it's in a Paragon section of the wheel, we understand it to be something that, you know, Shepard's going to do the right thing in the right way. So in this case, it gives it a, a, a dramatic coloring, which is now we understand it to be something very positive. Like, you know, Shepard's going to, he's going to look into this. He's not just doing it flippantly or whatever. Uh, it allows us to really narrow down the interpretation of what that choice means. And also, if we look at uh, the investigate, abusing suspects, my expectation here is that I'll be getting more information about who's, exp who's, who's uh, abusing suspects. So, um, like I said, it, there's two layers here, and that's the big takeaway here. There's the cognitive and there's the behavioral, and they interact with each other to allow us to have predictability in the role-playing experience. So the next one is choice produces the results the player expects. Um, so this is pretty self-explanatory. If you make a choice... You expect something to happen. If, as a designer, if I don't meet that expectation, your role-playing experience is now busted. Um, so we're going to look at something here. Uh, we're going to look at uh, a dancer on Ilium. And we're going to use what we learned on the predictability of the interface here. And we're going to move around just one little aspect of the narrative design and just see how much of a change that makes to uh, what the player expects. So... As we ship the game, when you talk to this uh, dancer, you can tip her, and she'll dance for you and, and uh, all that. So it's in the paragon position, which is like, okay, well, the subtext can be interpreted as, you know, Shepard's tipping her, he, you know, maybe he, he liked the dancing, uh, gives her a tip, and really that closes my expectation. Like, you know, it's like, wow, that's cool, and I can move on. I'm not really expecting much more. So let's take a look at that interaction. So, so at that point, the player's like, oh, okay, that's cool. It's, uh, it's a very light interaction. It just happens in one of the clubs. And, eh, okay, that's fine. But what happens now if I move the tip to the investigate portion of the wheel? Right? Now it's kind of like, okay, well, what's next? Right? So let's take a look at that one with the subtext of there's more information. So as you can see, nothing happened. Like, I, I made a choice and I got kicked out back to the first choice and nothing really occurred, right? So really, I'm, I'm, at this point, the, the player could, be felt, it could feel really cheated with this interaction going, okay, well, do I have to keep tipping her for a plot to open up? Um, is there something else that I need to do? I'm very confused at this point. So really, that, that would be an error in design in narrative design right there, where we don't meet the expectation of the player. So, once again, what if we moved it to the renegade? 
well, you know, uh, you know, use your imagination. It could be pretty much anything at that point. But, um, you know, as you can see, by just changing positions on the wheel, we're adding subtext to uh, just a, a, a word that says tip. And we're adding that predictability to the interface, and uh, we're trying to meet expectation whenever possible. So the last one, or our third, I should say, there's one more after this, uh, is give the, place, give the player choices they want. Now, and, and, and I often preface this with uh, when they want to make them, which is also very important. So one of the things that we're going to be looking at here is another video clip. And this video clip is an, a, of an interrogation sequence that happens. Now, Shepard's interrogating somebody. So, you know, if, if I'm a player and Shepard's interrogating somebody, I expect Shepard might get rough with them. So, if, as a designer, if I don't put that interaction in, I'm not meeting someone's expectations of what an interrogation should be. So that's exactly what we did with some interrupts uh, with this interaction. I want to see my advocate. Your advocate hasn't arrived. We're trying to find him. I'm not saying a damn word until he's here. You two are in way over here. Pay attention, Mr. Callum. That wasn't a good idea, kid. That is going to cost you. Control your temper. We want him to talk. Sorry, my associate gets a little excited during interrogations. Get me again, asshole. Every bunch is another credit in my pocket. Works for me. No! Do you know what I'll do to you when I get out of here? Keep it up, tough guy. You'll leave in a bag. Go to hell. I, I think female shepherd rocks, by the way. Yeah. So, uh, so what happened there? So the VO and the situation all kind of supported and focused the player to have this interaction which allowed them to hit them. So, you know, while he's saying it and you're like, wow, this guy really sucks. Like, God, I wish I could hit him. And bang, that thing pops up. And you're like, that's fantastic. I really feel like I wanted to make that choice. And there it was. Um, other, other kind of examples of that would have been uh, on the game when, um, uh, when, T when Tally's dad's kind of dead there. Uh, spoiler alert. Um, but, uh, and, and she's crying, and most players are like, wow, you know, I wish I could just hug her. And then the interrupt comes up, and then you can hug her, and it closes that loop on expectation. And you feel really great and good about that, about that interaction. So we're going to look at the opposite now, where, you know, maybe things don't go good. Like, there's a lot of stuff in this game, right? So uh, we're going to look at somewhere where choices are kind of weird and, and kind of didn't work. So in this one, we're going to look at a shopkeeper on the Citadel. Good day, my friends. Welcome to the Citadel. So we're given a choice, which is like accused of classism. And it's just like, okay, well, you know, I, there was no setup. I, I have no idea. She just said, welcome. Uh, so let me, let's just see what happens if I press this button. You know, for a bunch of cheap touristy crap, your prices are pretty high. I am sorry you feel that way. There are many stores on the Citadel. Perhaps another would be more in your price range. So you're saying I'm poor? Just because I'm not as well off as you doesn't mean you can hold yourself above me. What? No, I... Hey, everyone! This store discriminates against the poor. Please, calm down. As an apology, I'll let you have my station employee discount. Is that acceptable? Well, all right. But you still have my feelings. Please, enjoy your shopping experience. So, and we all really love that interaction. But it actually doesn't really work. Because it's like, okay, accuse of classism, make a choice, and kind of sit back and watch and... Really, I don't really have any agency, and Shepard's talking, and I can't say anything. So it breaks a lot of the rules of the agreement. And that's really a great example of where things go wrong. And ways we could have fixed it could have been uh, we gave a little interaction with somebody uh, right before we stepped into them. Maybe we give her some lines, uh, maybe some ambient stuff. Like, there's things we could have done to repair that situation. But um, with time's constraints the way they are, some things have to slip. So really we have these two ideas of choices you want and results you expect. And really, there, it really is a cycle that happens uh, when, we, when, we, when we're dealing with this uh, objective narrative. So when we talk about choices you want and, and results you expect, and that's always being constantly reinforced as you're playing, we get what you call role-playing flow. 
and you're really in the zone at this point and you're getting what you want and you're, and you're making choices and it's really awesome. But really, you're, you're not, this is not a real traditional role-playing experience. This is like, you know, like I said, this is not you. This is another character. And, um, you know, through fantasy fulfillment, through this idea of, of you know, keeping people in the zone, uh, we can still maintain a lot of the characteristics of, of the traditional role-playing experience in this new model. So, uh, one of the other ones that we got here is, uh, it's the player story. And this is, uh, something that we really take seriously at Bioware. And you know what? Sometimes it, it backfires on us. Like, it, you get into a lot of situations when it's like, wow, you're ready to go to Endgame and everything's really awesome and you, you know, you got your love interest and it's really good. But then you stop by the Citadel by fish, right? It's just, the, it, it, it's, it's this idea of absurdity that can happen in the narrative. And if you ask writers and traditional cinematic artists, they all go kind of crazy and they're like, no, 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 but drama and this and that and the other. But it's all emergent. It's the idea that you can do whatever you want. You're building your story. It's unique to you. And that's what we're really trying to push with Bioware. So, what, so let's talk about the player story for a second. And kind of one of the biggest things that we did uh, with the sequel and what we're planning to do with uh, Mass Effect 3 as well is this idea of importing your save game. And, and this is something which was obviously very technical to try to do uh, on a number of levels. But it really illustrates our, our commitment to making sure that the actual whole story is yours. You know, this is, this is something which is unique to you, and then you can tell your friends and compare notes and go, wow, you know, like, I had this experience and that experience, and, and, and it really just becomes about you at, the, at that point. So what is it? It's your continuing story uh, for Mass Effect. Uh, it allows us to get some plot threads and, and bring them forward. And it really is the, uh, the uber feature of the Mass Effect universe. Uh, we are story-driven games. BioWare is committed to making the best story-driven games in the world. So um, features like this really fall in line with what we're trying to achieve. So... How much actually came across? And, you know, I, I, see, I see a lot of things in the blogosphere and the rest about um, it not being, uh, a, you know, there's not enough choice and not enough things came across. But in reality, we had 700 different hooks that came across for, uh, from ME1 to ME2 that changed the narrative based on choice you had from the first one. And what we found, really, is it's the small things that matter. It's the small things that make it your story. Um, obviously, with the second title, it's really hard to branch the narrative in some gigantic way. It's, you know, scope gets out of control and, um, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's just not practical to do. But what, what can we do? What, you know, how can we make this your personal story? Um, so I'm going to show you some examples of things, just real small things. And if you can imagine the next thing kind of, you know, uh, multiplied by 700, uh, you can get an idea of, of what we've been trying to accomplish with this particular feature. So here's a shot of a really ugly shepherd on ME1. Uh, and uh, I don't know uh, if anybody remembers this. This is the big choice, save the council, let the council die, let the council live. So we let the council die. Um, you know, they weren't, they weren't really much use to us and uh, they, were kind of, uh, they were kind of off-putting. So we're going to take that choice and we're going to bring it forward to Mass Effect 2 and give you some examples of, of things we did with that. So uh, we have these advertising um, um, uh, kiosks on the Citadel, and <coughs> excuse me, uh, they did allow us to do some really cool things. And uh, what we're going to see here is a movie that someone made of your exploits on the Citadel from Mass Effect 1. And um, there's a lot of things that change about that movie based on your choices and actions on the first one. So we're going to take a look at The Council is Dead.
So there's a couple of things in there. It's a, it's a fall release. Uh, it's not a summer blockbuster. Uh, you know, uh, Shepard's actions were there. Uh, it was male Shepard in the ad. Um, so let's see what it looks like. Council is alive, but this time with a female player. Summer Blockbuster. Fantastic. So um, uh, what we saw there was really four different permutations to one interaction that could happen. Uh, you know, council is dead, alive, male, female. Uh, and this is a very simple example uh, of something that we do uh, pretty much everywhere in the game in order to make the, y your story. So uh, the last topic here, uh, I'm going to try to get through. I don't know everybody's, uh, we're running a little late here. So the idea of quick time events, and you know, uh, these things got a real bad rap uh, over the last little while. Um, but we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you how we kind of took the idea of quick time events and integrated it into our philosophy of the agreement. So what are we trying to solve for with 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 interrupts? So like, you know, if we're gonna add a feature, we got to be solving some sort of problem. So this is what we were trying to solve for. What are you looking at? So. Okay. Sure. I'm looking at somebody. Okay, this is getting uncomfortable. Uh, man, damn about the real. Uh, I'm not looking for trouble. So, we still have problems with temporal distortion. And really, it's a side effect of adding interactivity into the cinematic space. So the idea of quick time events, or really this idea of adding these interrupts, or these very visceral quick time uh, events that would allow the player to take control of situations and really allow them to steer the narrative in a real-time way. So this is our first sort of foray into the real-time ca uh, character interaction uh, side of design. So when we talk about interrupts, we're talking about a couple of things. Uh, we, have, uh, we have these renegade interrupts. We have paragon interrupts. But we never have both on the screen at once. And it was one of the, uh, one of the design philosophies we, we had is the fact that, uh, okay, well, making a choice, and because we had to make these very binary. We found that giving people too much choice in this real-time space confused a lot of people. It was just too much. So really, we just ended up making it one choice or the other. This moment was either Renegade or Paragon. But we, there was a lot of interesting things that came out of that. And one of the interesting things that uh, we found is if you're playing as a Paragon and a Renegade moment came up, people were very conflicted about whether they should take it or not. Because, man, if they see a flashing icon, they really want to take it. But that's not the way I'm playing. And like, you know, and if you look at some of the biometric readings on this stuff, man, it's just all over the map. And they haven't done anything. Like, you know, it's like they're just sitting there and they're just really getting conflicted and having some internal conflict. So not having, not making a choice was actually very powerful. So we kind of kept everything very constrained to that sort of uh, design philosophy. So let's apply the agreement to this and see how it lands. So firstly... Interface for choice is predictable. Sure, there it is. It's uh, Renegade, it's Paragon, it's left side, it's right side. It's pretty easy. And when it, when it comes up, I can train the player to always take that one. And, you know, so I would say, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Give the player choices they want. Well, we saw, as we saw with the interrogation scene, you know, it really depends on the writing and iterating with the writers to make sure that they do give you choices they want. It's the player's story. Like I said, sometimes not making an interrupt can be more powerful than taking one. So, yeah, you know, I'd say it's, it's the player's story. Choice produces results the player expects. Well, this ended up being a little hard for us. Because it was a real-time interaction, we didn't have 
the ability of getting any of the of the cognitive sort of paraphrasing into this into this space. So, what do we do? Uh, you know, we on the first implementation, it was really a lot of bro- broken role playing. Uh, you know, people accidentally shooting other people in the face. It was like. <laughs> It was just, it was, it was all over the place. So we had to really come up with a, a different idea of how to implement it. And what we came up with was this idea of telegraphing, which is really just a visual paraphrase. Um, it helps predict the specific action that's going to be made and lets the cognitive player make a meaningful choice. So I'm going to show you some examples of what I mean by a visual paraphrase. So we have a situation where Shepard talks to a suspect and then Shepard just attacks him. So if there was an interrupt there, you'd have no idea that, like, yeah, yeah, you know it's going to be a renegade action, but there's, there's so many shades of gray there. Uh, Icky could slap him, he could shoot him, he can push him, he could do, he could talk mean to him. Like, you know, there's just so much there that uh, it really doesn't help with the predictability of the role playing. So, let's take a look at what that interaction looks like with, uh, without a telegraph. Yeah, yeah. I told you, I ain't saying nothing. Fine, we'll do it the hard way. Oh, oh God, Dave, help me. So, uh, you know, in that case, it's like, okay, well, I didn't want to push on this poor kid. Like, you know, you have to, like, people have a, a, a lot of really strong feelings toward these digital actors that like, you have to really respect. So it's like, wow, you know what? I didn't want to do that. My role playing's broken. Bioware, I hate you. It just goes on and on. So we had this idea of a telegraph. So this wouldn't work. So, oh, fine, what do we do now? So we add, a, we add another shot to the sequence where Shepard starts to crack his knuckles. And this allows us to say, hey, you know what? This, I, I have, now I have a really good idea. Not only do I know that it's a renegade action, he's cracking his knuckles. I bet you he's going to hit him. So let's see what that looks like now. But you can for me. You gave another drill instructions for an assassination. Who's the target? I, I don't know. I didn't ask. Because the people I work for? We don't have time for this. Oh, oh God. Dave. So the cinematic designer there very cleverly just put a small little knuckle crack animation, which now made the, the role-playing experience uh, what people expect. So we would consider that very successful. So in conclusion, uh, I just want to hit a couple of really uh, real, real powerful points here. Is Interactivity is a very potent narrative device. And putting activity into cinematics is something we should all be looking at. Uh, really, the, the idea of the linear cinematic has been around for a long, long time and hasn't really changed much. Uh, you know, yes, we get into facial mocap and a lot of the crazy stuff to make the fidelity up. But we're forgetting these are game systems, and what they do really well is, intera- is be interactive. The other is perspective is powerful, so making sure that when you start writing your game, you choose your perspective very wisely, and discover your agreement, and whenever you can, stick with it. Thank you very much.